Today, we will be discussing therapeutic exercise for neck pain. Objectives for this module are to discuss patient populations and indications for treatment of muscular function in patients with neck pain, describe how to prescribe and progress exercise for cervical muscle dysfunction, discuss how to integrate cervical exercise into function, and introduce sensory motor treatment. Goals of Cervical Stabilization Exercise Like we learned in the lumbar spine, we want to teach the patient to find and maintain a neutral spine to allow for better force distribution and improved resting states of muscles. We also want to selectively train the deep neck flexors, including the longest capitis and longest coli, to minimize shear force between the facet joints. If the deeper muscles are inhibited, similar to the lumbar spine, we will see more global activation of muscles which are not intended to be spine stabilizers. These muscles may develop trigger points and become pain generators themselves. If we can get the correct muscle firing patterns, we may see reciprocal inhibition of those on spasm or in pain states. Similarly, if the global muscles are hyperactive, they will limit motion. Moving in a pain-free range will improve the psychology of the patient decreasing the fear of movement. We also see an immediate relief in pain when training appropriately, as well as prevention of chronic pain in injury recurrence. Evidence for Stabilization Exercise, a Change in Histology From a histological standpoint, we see differences in those with and without pain. As you can see in the photo, the cross-sectional area of the cervical multifidus, one of the important stabilizers, changes. Fatty infiltrates are also observed along with transition from type 1 to type 2B fibers. The consequence of this is a decrease in endurance capacity of this muscle. Evidence for stabilization exercise, a change in function. Moving to the front of the cervical spine, we see a change in performance of the longus capitis and longus coli. The latency of firing increases, meaning that when moving their neck and or other limbs, there is a slight delay in those with neck pain. With the hypofunctioning of these muscles, the SCM and anterior scalene decide to pick up the slack, which can lead to increased joint shearing and hyperactivity. We can also see a loss of endurance. We see When we see a loss of endurance of these muscles, it leads to poor postural support and an increased firing of global muscles. Evidence of exercise, axioscapular changes. We also see changes in the performance moving down the spine to the muscles of the thoracic spine and shoulder girdle. Overfiring of the upper trapezius is noted not only with physical tasks of moving the arms, but also with mental tasks. We also see a delay in the serratus anterior, which may lead, again, to overfiring of other muscles, including the upper trapezius, to upwardly rotate the scapula. Impaired performance of postural stabilizers, specifically the lower trapezius, will create an increased anterior tilt of the scapula, changing the biomechanics of the upper quarter. A nice summary and way to remember the common impairments is depicted in this picture and called upper cross syndrome. Observe here that the inhibited neck flexors, lower trapezius, and serratus anterior, along with tight pectoralis, upper trapezius, and levator scapula, can create the postural impairments you observed early in your academic career. Regardless of which came first, poor posture or poor muscle performance, both need to be addressed and you will learn how to in lab. So can we change these findings? A very big yes. Good news to us in those we treat. We can make a positive change on all the consequences of improper posture and pain. So do all neck pain patients need exercise? My answer is yes, but the timing in which you introduce and the prioritization 
may vary depending on the category of the patient as well as the ICF model. We see immediate introduction and high prioritization of exercise in those with green boxes and an initial lower prioritization in those with yellow. Our goal with the yellow boxes is to move them out of these pain dominant states into more of the green category and then exercise becomes a priority. We see high levels of exercise priority in the listed special populations, including those with temporomandibular joint dysfunction, cervicogenic dizziness, whiplash associated disorder, and chronic neck pain. Clinically, we use the rich information we receive from their observational movement analysis. If we see a faulty movement pattern which logically relates to their complaints, we address it with corrective exercise and movement cueing. In the next couple of videos, you will see what I am referencing. This first video demonstrates a poor movement pattern into extension. In her first attempt, you will see almost no movement coming from the CT junction or thoracic spine with most at the mid cervical spine. In her second attempt, you will see cervical protrusion with only capital extension versus cervical extension. And finally, on her good attempt, you will see cervical retraction with movement down to the CT junction. You will also see a return from extension with a chin tuck initiating the movement. In this second video, you will see the inability to isolate a plane of motion. In her first movement, she will move into rotation, but then also compensatory side bending. In her second movement, she will move into side bending with compensatory rotation. And finally, in this video, you'll see a motor control impairment into shoulder flexion. As you can see, she initiates the movement with excessive overtrapezius firing and also capital extension that is uncompensated for by the deep neck flexors. Before you is the most recent updated clinical practice guidelines. As you can see, most, if not all patients receive exercise training, the timing of which depends on their diagnostic category. For example, in those with acute neck pain with mobility deficits, mobility is their initial priority. This priority changes as the patient progresses to a less severe and irritable pain state and or to the subacute phase. This differs from those categorized by neck pain with headaches, where you see cervical strength as the priority throughout. Both situations receive exercise. It is the priority and timing that is different. Applying the FIT principles you have learned to this patient population, we see we need lower loads which are pain-free and short of fatigue. We also want longer hold times and higher rep counts to focus on type 1 muscle fibers and their endurance capacity. When issuing a home program, we encourage the patient to perform these exercises twice a day. Upon progressing the patient out of the activation stage and into return to function, we want to apply the principle of task specificity. The progression of these patients is linear, beginning with activation, progressing towards endurance training. Once this is accomplished, you can train movement patterns, which you will observe in lab, and then progress to strength and function. When creating an exercise plan for patients, it can be compromised of multiple components depending on your exam findings. It can include one or all of the listed components mobility, activation of deep neck flexors and multifidus, postural education, scapular kinetics, thoracic spine mobility and motor performance, core, and sensory motor training. You have learned the skills of the muscle length assessments and joint assessments. Another test to include in your exam is the cranial cervical flexion test. With this test, we are quantifying the performance of the deep neck flexors.
pain-free patients can hold cranial flexion for up to 10 seconds without compensation of superficial muscle firing or pain. The cutoff indicating poor performance is when a patient is unable to hold a contraction for 10 seconds or unable to increase forces by 6 millimeters of mercury. A more advanced test is the cervical flexion endurance test. The patient is asked to perform cranial flexion and the clinician notes the angle or position via skin folds. The patient is then asked to lift the head one inch off the table. When the patient loses their good cranial flexion and or they are unable to maintain the height of their head, the test is terminated and that time is recorded. Poor performance is indicated in those that cannot hold greater than 20 seconds. Other performance tests to consider. Some of the studies looking at exercise took a more pragmatic approach, meaning they treated impairments specific to the patient versus a standardized protocol. To look for these impairments, I encourage you to use these listed tests. The scapular retraction depression test observes the performance of the lower trapezius. For other muscles, please refer back to your old notes and review for proficiency. Our final set of performance tests look at sensory motor function, the first being cervical position sense. What we are looking for with this test is proprioception. Any patient with neck pain, especially noted in those with a traumatic onset such as whiplash-associated disorder, concussion, and those that complain of dizziness, can experience dysfunction in this realm. Reference the next video for setup, instruction, and interpretation. Those that are unable to land in the green zone signifying a 4.5 degree error are considered to have impairments in proprioception. In this video, the patient is seated 90 centimeters from the wall with a laser mounted on his head. The physical therapist moves the patient into rotation, asks him to close his eyes, and then attempt to return to the starting position. He repeats this into both flexion and extension. Note how he has more difficulty in accuracy in returning from flexion than he does any other direction. Though not included in every cervical spine patient exam, we want to familiarize you to other tests to assess sensory motor functions. These include balance assessments, as you have learned, including tandem stance, single leg stance with eyes open and eyes closed, smooth pursuit, gaze stability, saccadic eye movement, and eye head coordination. These tests are typically reserved for those who complain of dizziness, have a traumatic onset, are in chronic pain, and or are not responsive to your current plan of care. These videos are, are examples of exercises you may perform in the clinic depending on your exam findings of the prior examination items. In this first video on your left, you will see our patient demonstrating an exercise for gaze stabilization. She keeps her eyes focused on the target in front of her while she moves her head in all directions. You can vary speed and surface she's sitting on for progression. In the video on the far right, the patient is starting to perform head-eye coordination exercises. She first keeps her head between the spots while she moves her eyes from one spot to the other. 
She then progresses to moving her eye to one spot and her head to that same spot and then moving her eyes into the other spot with her head following. The final progression is moving her head and eyes in opposite directions. You may also progress this by speed and surface she is sitting on. Again, you can make progressions by increasing speed and decreasing postural stability. One sensory motor exercise to In the third and final video, in the center, the patient is working on ocular tracking. She is keeping her head stable as she moves the target and tracks it with her eyes. She moves both horizontal, vertical, and then diagonally. You may also progress this with speed and surface she is sitting or standing on. And postural support. I want to reference this study for you. Again, depending on the setting you find yourself in, you will use this in a smaller percentage of your cervical pain patients. We will expose you to this in lab. To summarize, the researchers in this study found success by progressing patients through six supervised sessions, including exercise to improve cervical position sense, eye following, gaze stabilization, and eye head coordination. Patients were challenged with the change in range of motion, speed, and the surface they were sitting or standing on. Patients were also encouraged to perform a home exercise program for 20 minutes daily. Thank you for listening. I hope this information is helpful prior to lab. On this slide, you will see a link to YouTube listing the exercises we will be exposing you to in lab. We will start reviewing your five question quiz with a question and answer session following. We will then use the remaining time to practice exercise prescription and cueing. Looking forward to seeing you in lab.